1933 and they set about establishing the most comprehensive and all-encompassing propaganda machine that the world had ever seen. World War II wasn't just a war of military might, it was a war of ideologies between the democratic freedom of the Allies and the authoritarianism of the Third Reich. Hitler was well aware of the power of propaganda, so much so that he dedicated two full chapters of his book Mein Kampf to its usefulness. He highlights the effectiveness of Allied propaganda in winning the First World War, praising its repetition, repeatedly appealing to the emotions of the British people and painting the Germans as beastly Huns. He also looked to the masterful use of propaganda in the Soviet regime in appealing to all aspects of society. In Mein Kampf, Hitler outlines what he sees as the key principles of effective propaganda. It should be focused and one-sided. It should be consistent across multiple platforms. It should never be weakened by objective analysis and it should be boiled down to a few key themes or phrases which are continually repeated. He used this style of propaganda first to justify his dictatorship and later to legitimize one of the worst atrocities in human history. In Book 8 of The Republic, philosopher Plato describes a fictional, democratic city. Plato asserts that the freedom of democracy could be undermined by a cunning manipulator, who by using the language of freedom and the disguise of the people's protector, coerces them into voting against their own self-interest, willingly trading their democracy for authoritarianism and tyranny. In the case of the Third Reich, this cunning manipulator wasn't Hitler, but Joseph Goebbels, head of the Nazi Ministry of Propaganda. What separated the Nazi propaganda machine from the British or American was that the Nazis operated total media control with the goal of complete indoctrination of all of its citizens. Every meaningful aspect of culture that could be consumed from the press, radio, theater, art, music, and cinema was produced or approved by the regime, and it all pulled towards the same goal of conditioning the German people into believing the racist, authoritarian ideology of the party. It's the propaganda of Goebbels that gives us the images of Nazi Germany that we have today. He's responsible for creating the depiction of Hitler as a master orator and a genius political tactician, and his campaign of indoctrination helped transition Germany from the relative freedom of the Weimar Republic to the tyranny of the National Socialist. Lists. And one of the tools that he used to do that was the Triumph of the Will. Triumph of the Will is a semi-documentary take on the 6th annual National Socialist Conference in Nuremberg in 1934 by director Lenny Reifenstahl. It covers four days worth of speeches, parades and citywide celebration. It's edited together out of hundreds of hours of footage and it unveils the core message of the conference without commentary or intertitle. Although it's often praised as revolutionising the art of film propaganda, it actually adds very few techniques of its own instead drawing on the decades of development in propaganda that came before. Let's take a look at the propaganda techniques in the Triumph of the Will and how they're used to advance the Nazi ideology. Sometimes when looking for the aims of a piece of propaganda, you needn't look much further than the aims of the people who produced it. Hitler was appointed Chancellor in Germany in 1933. In February, he used the burning of the Reichstag to suppress civil liberties and remove political opponents from power. In March, he passed the Enabling Act, allowing him to enact policy without approval of parliament, and in June he took one of the final steps towards complete consolidation of power in the country. The Night of the Long Knives, a systematic slaying of anybody who might challenge him, including those from within his own party. Having secured political power, Hitler looked to use propaganda to downplay the violent treachery that gave him his position and inspire unconditional loyalty and support for him and his party. Although it's presented as an objective fly-on-the-wall documentary, this is the true aim of the Triumph of the Will. The opening shots give us a glimpse into the kind of imagery that we can expect from the rest of the film. Aerial shots of pure white cloud give way to the city of Nuremberg. We see the St. Lorenz Cathedral draped in the Nazi flag, and immediately the parallel is drawn between the regime and religion. Then as the plane lands, Hitler emerges as if descending from heaven. The very first depiction of Hitler engenders him with a divine status. Reifenstahl shows us seemingly endless crowds of loyal, awestruck supporters, all looking to Hitler as saviour. Hitler is adored by all, adults and children, civilian and military. 
the arrival of Hitler in Nuremberg is that of a messianic figure. Borrowing from British propaganda, this point is hammered home. Look at these million supporters, again and again, and again and again. Low shots of Hitler paint him as the supreme leader towering above the masses, almost godlike in his unchallenged authority. The film hits the same notes over and over, camaraderie, obedience, loyalty. An intellectual montage lifted directly from Sergei Eisenstein and Soviet propaganda show Hitler as he walks through the crowd, shaking hands with his troops, intercut with repeated artillery fire. The parallel is clear, through unity and loyalty to Hitler comes military strength and victory. The strength of the German military is repeatedly shown to us through parades and demonstration. Even the Reich labor service operate with military efficiency. Military superiority isn't just implied, it's inevitable. This is a depiction of a holy army graced by God with their racial superiority. A common tactic of propaganda is to create a nostalgic appeal to a prior golden age and suggest that this former glory can somehow be recaptured. In the case of the triumph of the will, this golden age is Germany from before World War I. The film opens with the title card reminding the audience of the horrors of the war that started 20 years earlier. We're later introduced to people marching in traditional German dress and as they shake hands with Hitler, the suggestion is that this is the redawning of Germany's pre war glory. Building on this, we're constantly reminded of the sacrifice made by those who fought in the war. Traditional folk tunes are slowly replaced by more militaristic music. Comparisons are drawn between sacrificing yourself for your country and immortality. The film is calling on Germany's young to give themselves for the cause of the Third Reich, and with Hitler, rebuild Germany like a phoenix from the ashes. The entire film is pointed to one message, and it can be summed up by the closing lines of the film. The Partei is Hitler! Hitler aber ist Deutschland, wie Deutschland Hitler ist! Hitler sieg! Triumph of the Will is often heralded as a crowning achievement in cinematic propaganda, but at its heart, it's no more than an elaborate version of tearing down the Spanish flag from 1898. Though it borrows from the authenticity of the documentary medium, and Reifenstahl insisted that the film was an unbiased representation of true events, the truth is that the whole conference was staged and orchestrated specifically for the film. Reifenstahl helped organize events, had a hand in the overall design, and even had bridges towers and ramps built in the city centre to magnify the effect of the conference on screen. The film is a carefully staged and managed event designed to pull the National Socialist ideology from its context. All the information that the audience receives is contained within the frame and anything external to the borders of the screen is unimportant. The film does not deal with policy or argument. Every frame is designed to appeal to the audience's emotion while willfully disregarding the violent, thuggish behaviour that helped get Hitler to power. Though the film does mention the ideas of racial purity, it purposely does not reflect the persecution of Jewish, black, disabled, homosexual or Roma people that was already well underway by 1934. This kind of propaganda is so effective that even today, more than 80 years later, there are still people who purposely disregard the unprecedented horror of the Holocaust, the systematic slaughter of over 11 million people, and allow themselves to be swayed by an unthinking, staged appeal to their emotions. Far from the genius work of art that its reputation would have you believe, Triumph of the Will stands as a testament of the ability of blunt emotional attacks to overwhelm rationality, and its evidence to the necessity of media criticism. Propaganda still affects us every day. Although the technology behind it is much more developed, it still operates on the same basic principles. So if a piece of media, particularly one from a government or a political group, has made you angry or scared or elated, ask yourself what information has been included and what context has been left out. Why was that particular emotional response targeted and who stands to gain from exploiting it?